Section 4 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, Chapter 1, Part 2. From the foregoing remarks, it seems probable that some actions, which were at first performed consciously, have become, through habit and association, converted into reflex actions, and are now so firmly fixed and inherited that they are performed, even when not of the least use, as often as the same causes arise, which originally excited them in us through the volition. In such cases, the sensory nerve cells excite the motor cells, without first communicating with those cells on which our consciousness and volition depend. It is probable that sneezing and coughing were originally acquired by the habit of expelling, as violently as possible, any irritating particle from the sensitive air passages. As far as time is concerned, there has been more than enough for these habits to have become innate or converted into reflex actions, for they are common to most or all of the higher quadrupeds, and must therefore have been first acquired at a very remote period. Why the act of clearing the throat is not a reflex action, and has to be learnt by our children, I cannot pretend to say, but we can see why blowing the nose on a handkerchief has to be learnt. It is scarcely credible that the movements of a headless frog, when it wipes off a drop of acid or other object from its thigh, and which movements are so well coordinated for a special purpose, were not at first performed voluntarily, being afterwards rendered easy through long-continued habit, so as at last to be performed unconsciously or independently of the cerebral hemispheres. So again it appears probable that starting was originally acquired by the habit of jumping away as quickly as possible from danger whenever any of our senses gave us warning. Starting, as we have seen, is accompanied by the blinking of the eyelids, so as to protect the eyes, the most tender and sensitive organs of the body. And it is, I believe, always accompanied by a sudden and forcible inspiration, which is the natural preparation for any violent effort. But when a man or horse starts, his heart beats wildly against his ribs. And here, it may be truly said, we have an organ which has never been under the control of the will, partaking in the general reflex movements of the body. To this point, however, I shall return in a future chapter. The contraction of the iris, when the retina is stimulated by a bright light, is another instance of a movement which it appears cannot possibly have been at first voluntarily performed and then fixed by habit. For the iris is not known to be under the conscious control of the will in any animal. In such cases, some explanation, quite distinct from habit, will have to be discovered. The radiation of nerve force from strongly excited nerve cells to other connected cells, as in the case of a bright light on the retina, causing a sneeze, may perhaps aid us in understanding how some reflex actions originated. A radiation of nerve force of this kind, if it caused a movement, tending to lessen the primary irritation, as in the case of the contraction of the iris, preventing too much light from falling on the retina, might afterwards have been taken advantage of and modified for this special purpose. It further deserves notice that reflex actions are, in all probability, liable to slight variations, as are all corporeal structures and instincts, and any variations which were beneficial and of sufficient importance would tend to be preserved and inherited. Thus, reflex actions, when once gained for one purpose, might afterwards be modified independently of the will or habit so as to serve for some distinct purpose. Such cases would be parallel with those which, as we have every reason to believe, have occurred with many instincts. For although some instincts have been developed simply through long-continued and inherited habit, other highly complex ones have been developed through the preservation of variations of pre-existing instincts, that is, through natural selection. I have discussed at some little length, though as I am well aware, in a very imperfect manner, the acquirement of reflex actions, because they are often brought into play in connection with movements expressive of our emotions, and it was necessary to show that at least some of them might have been erst acquired through the will, in order to satisfy a desire, or to relieve a disagreeable sensation. 
associated habitual movements in the lower animals. I have already given, in the case of man, several instances of movements associated with various states of the mind or body, which are now purposeless, but which were originally of use, and are still of use under certain circumstances. As this subject is very important for us, I will here give a considerable number of analogous facts, with reference to animals, although many of them are of a very trifling nature. My object is to show that certain movements were originally performed for a definite end, and that under nearly the same circumstances they are still pertinaciously performed through habit, when not of the least use. That the tendency in most of the following cases is inherited, we may infer from such actions being performed in the same manner by all the individuals, young and old, of the same species. We shall also see that they are excited by the most diversified, often circuitous, and sometimes mistaken associations. Dogs, when they wish to go to sleep on a carpet or other hard surface, generally turn round and round, and scratch the ground with their forepaws in a senseless manner, as if they intended to trample down the grass and scoop out a hollow, as no doubt their wild parents did when they lived on open grassy plains or in the woods. Jackals, fennecs, and other allied animals in the zoological gardens treat their straw in this manner, but it's a rather odd circumstance that the keepers, after observing for some months, have never seen the wolves thus behave. A semi-idiotic dog and an animal in this condition would be particularly liable to follow a senseless habit, was observed by a friend, to turn completely round on a carpet thirteen times before going to sleep. Many carnivorous animals, as they crawl towards their prey and prepare to rush or spring on it, lower their heads and crouch partly, as it would appear, to hide themselves and partly to get ready for their rush. And this habit, in an exaggerated form, has become hereditary in our pointers and setters. Now I have noticed scores of times that when two strange dogs meet on an open road, the one which first sees the other, though at the distance of one or two hundred yards, after the first glance always lowers its head, generally crouches a little, or even lies down. That is, he takes the proper attitude for concealing himself and for making a rush or spring, although the road is quite open and the distance great. Again, dogs of all kinds, when intently watching and slowly approaching their prey, frequently keep one of their four legs doubled up for a long time, ready for the next cautious step. And this is eminently characteristic of the pointer. But from habit they behave in exactly the same manner, whenever their attention is aroused. I have seen a dog at the foot of a high wall, listening attentively to a sound on the opposite side, with one leg doubled up. And in this case there could have been no intention of making a cautious approach. Dogs, after voiding their excrement, often make with all four feet a few scratches backwards, even on a bare stone pavement, as if for the purpose of covering up their excrement with earth, in nearly the same manner as do cats. Wolves and jackals behave in the zoological gardens in exactly the same manner, yet, as I am assured by the keepers, neither wolves, jackals, nor foxes, when they have the means of doing so, ever cover up their excrement any more than do dogs. All these animals, however, bury superfluous food. Hence, if we rightly understand the meaning of the above cat-like habit, of which there can be little doubt, we have a purposeless remnant of an habitual movement which was originally followed by some remote progenitor of the dog genus for a definite purpose, and which has been retained for a prodigious length of time. Dogs and jackals take much pleasure in rolling and rubbing their necks and backs on carrion. The odor seems delightful to them, though dogs at least do not eat carrion. Mr. Bartlett has observed wolves for me and has given them carrion, but has never seen them roll on it. I have heard it remarked, and I believe it to be true, that the larger dogs, which are probably descended from wolves, do not so often roll in carrion as do smaller dogs, which are probably descended from jackals. When a piece of brown biscuit is offered to a terrier of mine and she is not hungry, and I have heard of similar instances, she first tosses it about and worries it, 
as if it were a rat or other prey. She then repeatedly rolls on it precisely as if it were a piece of carrion, and at last eats it. It would appear that an imaginary relish has to be given to the distasteful morsel. And to effect, this the dog acts in his habitual manner, as if the biscuit was a live animal or smelt like carrion, though he knows better than we do that this is not the case. I have seen this same terrier act in the same manner after killing a little bird or mouse. Dogs scratch themselves by a rapid movement of one of their hind feet, and when their backs are rubbed with a stick, so strong is the habit that they cannot help rapidly scratching the air or the ground in a useless and ludicrous manner. The terrier, just alluded to, when thus scratched with a stick, will sometimes show her delight by another habitual movement, namely, by licking the air as if it were my hand. Horses scratch themselves by nibbling those parts of their bodies which they can reach with their teeth, but more commonly one horse shows another where he wants to be scratched, and they then nibble each other. A friend whose attention I had called to the subject observed that when he rubbed his horse's neck, the animal protruded his head, uncovered his teeth, and moved his jaws, exactly as if nibbling on another horse's neck, for he could never have nibbled his own neck. If a horse is much tickled, as when curry combed, his wish to bite something becomes so intolerably strong that he will clatter his teeth together, and though not vicious, bite his groom. At the same time, from habit, he closely depresses his ears, so as to protect them from being bitten, as if he were fighting with another horse. A horse, when eager to start on a journey, makes the nearest approach which he can to the habitual movement of progression by pawing the ground. Now when horses in their stalls are about to be fed and are eager for their corn, they paw the pavement or the straw. Two of my horses thus behave when they see or hear the corn given to their neighbors. But here we have what may almost be called a true expression, as pawing the ground is universally recognized as a sign of eagerness. Cats cover up their excrements of both kinds with earth, and my grandfather saw a kitten scraping ashes over a spoonful of pure water spilt on the hearth, so that here a habitual or instinctive action was falsely excited, not by a previous act or by odor, but by eyesight. It is well known that cats dislike wetting their feet, owing, it is probable, to their having originally inhabited the dry country of Egypt, and when they wet their feet they shake them violently. My daughter poured some water into a glass close to the head of a kitten, and it immediately shook its feet in the usual manner, so that here we have a habitual movement, falsely excited by an associated sound, instead of by the sense of touch. Kittens, puppies, young pigs, and probably many other young animals alternately push with their forefeet against the mammary glands of their mothers to excite a freer secretion of milk, or to make it flow. Now, it is very common with young cats, and not at all rare with old cats of the common and Persian breeds, believed by some naturalists to be specifically extinct, when comfortably lying on a warm shawl or other soft substance, to pound it quietly and alternately with their forefeet, their toes being spread out and claws slightly protruded, precisely as when sucking their mother. That it is the same movement is clearly shown by their, often at the same time, taking a bit of the shawl into their mouths and sucking it, generally closing their eyes and purring from delight. This curious movement is commonly excited only in association with the sensation of a warm, soft surface. But I have seen an old cat, when pleased by having its back scratched, pounding the air with its feet in the same manner, so that this action has almost become the expression of a pleasurable sensation. Having referred to the act of sucking, I may add that this complex movement, as well as the alternate protrusion of the forefeet, are reflex actions, for they are performed if a finger moistened with milk is placed in the mouth of a puppy, the front part of whose brain has been removed. It has recently been stated in France that the action of sucking is excited solely through the sense of smell, so that if the olfactory nerves of a puppy are destroyed, it never sucks. 
In like manner, the wonderful power which a chicken possesses only a few hours after being hatched of picking up small particles of food seems to be started into action through the sense of hearing. For with chickens hatched by artificial heat, a good observer found that making a noise with the fingernail against a board, in imitation of the hen mother, first taught them to peck at their meat. I will give only one other instance of an habitual and purposeless movement. The shell drake feeds on the sands left uncovered by the tide. And when a worm cast is discovered, it begins patting the ground with its feet, dancing, as it were, over the hole. And this makes the worm come to the surface. Now, Mr. St. John says that when his tame shell drakes came to ask for food, they patted the ground in an impatient and rapid manner. This, therefore, may also be considered as their expression of hunger. Mr. Bartlett informs me that the flamingo and the kagu, when anxious to be fed, beat the ground with their feet in the same odd manner. So again, kingfishers, when they catch a fish, always beat it until it is killed. And in the zoological gardens, they always beat the raw meat, with which they are sometimes fed before devouring it. We have now, I think, sufficiently shown the truth of our first principle, namely that when any sensation, desire, or dislike has led during a long series of generations to some voluntary movement, then a tendency to the performance of a similar movement will almost certainly be excited, whenever the same or any analogous or associated sensation, although very weak, is experienced. Notwithstanding that the movement in this case may not be of the least use. Such habitual movements are often or generally inherited, and they then differ but little from reflex actions. When we treat of the special expressions of man, the latter part of our first principle, as given at the commencement of this chapter, will be seen to hold good, namely that when movements associated through habit with certain states of the mind are partially repressed by the will, the strictly involuntary muscles, as well as those which are least under the separate control of the will, are liable still to act, and their action is often highly expressive. Conversely, when the will is temporarily or permanently weakened, the voluntary muscles fail before the involuntary. It is a fact, familiar to pathologists, as Sir C. Bell remarks, that when debility arises from affection of the brain, the influence is greatest on those muscles which are, in their natural condition, most under the command of the will. We shall also, in our future chapters, consider another proposition, included in our first principle, namely that the checking of one habitual movement sometimes requires other slight movements, those latter serving as a means of expression. End of section 4 Section 5 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals Chapter 2 General Principles of Expression The Principle of Antithesis Instances in the Dog and Cat Origin of the Principle Conventional Signs The Principle of Antithesis has not arisen from opposite actions being consciously performed under opposite impulses. We will now consider our second principle, that of antithesis. Certain states of the mind lead, as we have seen in the last chapter, to certain habitual movements which were primarily or may still be of service. And we shall find that when a directly opposite state of mind is induced, there is a strong and involuntary tendency to the performance of movements of a directly opposite nature, though these have never been of any service. A few striking instances of antithesis will be given when we treat of the special expressions of man. But as, in these cases, we are particularly liable to confound conventional or artificial gestures and expressions with those which are innate or universal, and which alone deserve to rank as true expressions, I will, in the present chapter, almost confine myself to the lower animals. When a dog approaches a strange dog or man in a savage or hostile frame of mind, he walks upright and very stiffly. His head is slightly raised or not much lowered. The tail is held erect and quite rigid. The hairs bristle, especially along the neck and back. The pricked ears are directed forwards and the eyes have a fixed stare. These actions, as will hereafter be explained, 
follow from the dog's intention to attack his enemy and are thus to a large extent intelligible. As he prepares to spring with a savage growl on his enemy, the canine teeth are uncovered and the ears are pressed close backwards on the head. But with these latter actions, we are not here concerned. Let us now suppose that the dog suddenly discovers that the man he is approaching is not a stranger, but his master. And let it be observed how completely and instantaneously his whole bearing is reversed. Instead of walking upright, the body sinks downwards or even crouches and is thrown into flexuous movements. His tail, instead of being held stiff and upright, is lowered and wagged from side to side. His hair instantly becomes smooth. His ears are depressed and drawn backwards, but not closely to the head, and his lips hang loosely. From the drawing back of the ears, the eyelids become elongated, and the eyes no longer appear round and staring. It should be added that the animal is at such times an excited condition from joy, and nerve force will be generated in excess, which naturally leads to action of some kind. Not one of the above movements, so clearly expressive of affection, are of the least direct service to the animal. They are explicable, as far as I can see, solely from being in complete opposition or antithesis to the attitude and movements which, from intelligible causes, are assumed when a dog intends to fight, and which consequently are expressive of anger. I request the reader to look at the four accompanying sketches, which have been given in order to recall vividly the appearance of a dog under these two states of mind. It is, however, not a little difficult to represent affection in a dog, whilst caressing his master and wagging his tail, as the essence of the expression lies in the continuous flexuous movements. We will now turn to the cat. When this animal is threatened by a dog, it arches its back in a surprising manner, erects its hair, opens its mouth and spits. But we are not here concerned with this well-known attitude, expressive of terror combined with anger. We are concerned only with that of rage or anger. This is not often seen, but may be observed when two cats are fighting together. And I have seen it well exhibited by a savage cat whilst plagued by a boy. The attitude is almost exactly the same as that of a tiger disturbed and growling over its food, which everyone must have beheld in menageries. The animal assumes a crouching position, with a body extended, and the whole tail, or the tip alone, is lashed or curled from side to side. The hair is not in the least erect. Thus far, the attitude and movements are nearly the same as when the animal is prepared to spring on its prey, and when, no doubt, it feels savage. But when preparing to fight, there is this difference, that the ears are closely pressed backwards. The mouth is partially opened, showing the teeth. The forefeet are occasionally struck out with protruded claws, and the animal occasionally utters a fierce growl. All or almost all these actions naturally follow, as hereafter to be explained, from the cat's manner and intention of attacking its enemy. Let us now look at a cat in a directly opposite frame of mind, whilst feeling affectionate and caressing her master. And mark how opposite is her attitude in every respect. She now stands upright with her back slightly arched, which makes the hair appear rather rough, but it does not bristle. Her tail, instead of being extended and lashed from side to side, is held quite still and perpendicularly upwards. Her ears are erect and pointed, her mouth is closed, and she rubs against her master with a purr instead of a growl. Let it further be observed how widely different is the whole bearing of an affectionate cat from that of a dog when with his body crouching and fluctuous, his tail lowered and wagging, and ears depressed, he caresses his master. This contrast in the attitudes and movements of these two carnivorous animals, under the same pleased and affectionate frame of mind, can be explained, as it appears to me, solely by their movements standing in complete antithesis to those which are naturally assumed, when these animals feel savage and are prepared either to fight or to seize their prey. In these cases of the dog and cat, there is every reason to believe that the gestures both of hostility and affection are innate or inherited, for they are almost identically the same in the different races of the species, and in all the individuals of the same race, both young and old. I will here give one other instance of antithesis in expression. I formerly possessed a large dog who, like every other dog, was much pleased to go out walking. 
He showed his pleasure by trotting gravely before me with high steps, head much raised, moderately erected ears, and tail carried aloft but not stiffly. Not far from my house, a path branches off to the right, leading to the hothouse, which I used often to visit for a few moments to look at my experimental plants. This was always a great disappointment to the dog, as he did not know whether I should continue my walk. And the instantaneous and complete change of expression which came over him as soon as my body swerved in the least towards the path, and I sometimes tried this as an experiment, was laughable. His look of dejection was known to every member of the family and was called his hothouse face. This consisted in the head drooping much, the whole body sinking a little and remaining motionless, the ears and tail falling suddenly down, but the tail was by no means wagged. With the falling of the ears and of his great chaps, the eyes became much changed in appearance, and I fancied that they looked less bright. His aspect was that of piteous, hopeless dejection, and it was, as I have said, laughable, as the cause was so slight. Every detail in his attitude was in complete opposition to his former joyful yet dignified bearing, and can be explained, as it appears to me, in no other way, except through the principle of antithesis. Had not the change been so instantaneous, I should have attributed it to his lowered spirits affecting, as in the case of man, the nervous system and circulation, and consequently the tone of his whole muscular frame, and this may have been in part the cause. We will now consider how the principle of antithesis in expression has arisen. With social animals, the power of intercommunication between the members of the same community, and with other species, between the opposite sexes, as well as between the young and the old, is of the highest importance to them. This is generally affected by means of the voice, but it is certain that gestures and expressions are to a certain extent mutually intelligible. Man not only uses inarticulate cries, gestures, and expressions, but has invented articulate language. If, indeed, the word invented can be applied to a process, completed by innumerable steps, half consciously made. Any one who has watched monkeys will not doubt that they perfectly understand each other's gestures and expression, and to a large extent, as Renger asserts, those of man. An animal, when going to attack another, or when afraid of another, often makes itself appear terrible, by erecting its hair, thus increasing the apparent bulk of its body, by showing its teeth, or brandishing its horns, or by uttering fierce sounds. As the power of intercommunication is certainly of high service to many animals, there is no a priori improbability in the supposition that gestures manifestly of an opposite nature to those by which certain feelings are already expressed should at first have been voluntarily employed under the influence of an opposite state of feeling. The fact of the gestures being now innate would be no valid objection to the belief that they were at first intentional, for if practiced during many generations, they would probably at last be inherited. Nevertheless, it is more than doubtful, as we shall immediately see, whether any of the cases which come under our present head of antithesis have thus originated. With conventional signs which are not innate, such as those used by the deaf and dumb and by savages, the principle of opposition or antithesis has been partially brought into play. The Cistercian monks thought it sinful to speak, and as they could not avoid holding some communication, they invented a gesture language, in which the principle of opposition seems to have been employed. Dr. Scott of the Exeter Deaf and Dumb Institution writes to me that, Opposites are greatly used in teaching the deaf and dumb, who have a lively sense of them. Nevertheless, I have been surprised how few unequivocal instances can be adduced. This depends partly on all the signs having commonly had some natural origin, and partly on the practice of the deaf and dumb and of savages to contract their signs as much as possible for the sake of rapidity. Hence their natural source or origin often becomes doubtful or is completely lost, as is likewise the case with articulate language. Many signs, moreover, which plainly stand in opposition to each other, appear to have had on both sides a significant origin. This seems to hold good with the signs used by the deaf and dumb for light and darkness, for strength and weakness. In a future chapter I shall endeavor to show that the opposite gestures of affirmation and negation, namely vertically nodding and laterally shaking the head, have both probably had a natural beginning. The waving of the hand from right to left, 
which is used as a negative by some savages, may have been invented in imitation of shaking the head. But whether the opposite movement of waving the hand in a straight line from the face, which is used in affirmation, has arisen through antithesis or in some quite distinct manner, is doubtful. If we now turn to the gestures which are innate or common to all the individuals of the same species, and which come under the present head of antithesis, it is extremely doubtful whether any of them were at first deliberately invented and consciously performed. With mankind, the best instance of a gesture standing in direct opposition to other movements, naturally assumed under an opposite frame of mind, is that of shrugging the shoulders. This expresses impotence or an apology, something which cannot be done or cannot be avoided. The gesture is sometimes used consciously and voluntarily, but it is extremely improbable that it was at first deliberately invented and afterwards fixed by habit. For not only do young children sometimes shrug their shoulders under the above states of mind, but the movement is accompanied, as will be shown in a future chapter, by various subordinate movements, which not one man in a thousand is aware of unless he has specially attended to the subject. Dogs, when approaching a strange dog, may find it useful to show by their movements that they are friendly and do not wish to fight. When two young dogs in play are growling and biting each other's faces and legs, it is obvious that they mutually understand each other's gestures and manners. There seems, indeed, some degree of instinctive knowledge in puppies and kittens, that they must not use their sharp little teeth or claws too freely in their play, though this sometimes happens and a squeal is the result. Otherwise, they would often injure each other's eyes. When my terrier bites my hand in play, often snarling at the same time, if he bites too hard and I say, gently, gently, he goes on biting, but answers me by a few wags of the tail, which seems to say, never mind, it is all fun. Although dogs do thus express, and may wish to express, to other dogs and to man, that they are in a friendly state of mind, it is incredible that they could ever have deliberately thought of drawing back and depressing their ears, instead of holding them erect, of lowering and wagging their tails, instead of keeping them stiff and upright. Because they knew that these movements stood in direct opposition to those assumed under an opposite and savage frame of mind. Again, when a cat, or rather when some early progenitor of the species, from feeling affectionate first slightly arched its back, held its tail perpendicularly upwards and pricked its ears, can it be believed that the animal consciously wished thus to show that its frame of mind was directly the reverse of that, when from being ready to fight or to spring on its prey, it assumed a crouching attitude, curled its tail from side to side and depressed its ears? Even still less can I believe that my dog voluntarily put on his dejected attitude and hothouse face, which formed so complete a contrast to his previous cheerful attitude and whole bearing. It cannot be supposed that he knew that I should understand his expression, and that he could thus soften my heart and make me give up visiting the hothouse. Hence for the development of the movements which come under the present head, some other principle, distinct from the will and consciousness, must have intervened. This principle appears to be that every movement which we have voluntarily performed throughout our lives has required the action of certain muscles. And when we have performed a directly opposite movement, an opposite set of muscles has been habitually brought into play, as in turning to the right or to the left, in pushing away or pulling an object towards us, and in lifting or lowering a weight. So strongly are our intentions and movements associated together that if we eagerly wish an object to move in any direction, we can hardly avoid moving our bodies in the same direction, although we may be perfectly aware that this can have no influence. A good illustration of this fact has already been given in the introduction, namely, in the grotesque movements of a young and eager billiard player, whilst watching the course of his ball. A man or child in a passion, if he tells anyone in a loud voice to be gone, generally moves his arm as if to push him away, although the offender may not be standing near, and although there may be not the least need to explain by a gesture what is meant. On the other hand, if we eagerly desire someone to approach us closely, we act as if pulling him towards us, and so in innumerable other instances. 
as the performance of ordinary movements of an opposite kind under opposite impulses of the will has become habitual in us and in the lower animals, so when actions of one kind have become firmly associated with any sensation or emotion, it appears natural that actions of a directly opposite kind, though of no use, should be unconsciously performed through habit and association, under the influence of a directly opposite sensation or emotion. On this principle alone can I understand how the gestures and expressions which come under the present head of antithesis have originated. If indeed they are serviceable to man or to any other animal, in aid of inarticulate cries or language, they will likewise be voluntarily employed, and the habit will thus be strengthened. But whether or not of service as a means of communication, the tendency to perform opposite movements under opposite sensations or emotions would, if we may judge by analogy, become hereditary through long practice. And there cannot be a doubt that several expressive movements due to the principle of antithesis are inherited. End of section 5. Section 6 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 3. General Principles of Expression Concluded The principle of direct action of the excited nervous system on the body, independently of the will and in part of habit. Change of color in the hair. Trembling of the muscles. Modified secretions. Perspiration. Expression of extreme pain. Of rage, great joy, and terror. Contrast between the emotions which cause and do not cause expressive movements. Exciting and depressing states of the mind. Summary We now come to our third principle, namely that certain actions which we recognize as expressive of certain states of the mind are the direct result of the constitution of the nervous system, and have been from the first independent of the will, and to a large extent of habit. When the sensorium is strongly excited, nerve force is generated in excess, and is transmitted in certain directions dependent on the connection of the nerve cells, and, as far as the muscular system is concerned, on the nature of the movements which have been habitually practiced. Or the supply of nerve force may, as it appears, be interrupted. Of course, every movement which we make is determined by the constitution of the nervous system. But actions performed in obedience to the will, or through habit, or through the principle of antithesis, are here as far as possible excluded. Our present subject is very obscure, but from its importance must be discussed at some little length, and it is always advisable to perceive clearly our ignorance. The most striking case, though a rare and abnormal one, which can be adduced from the direct influence of the nervous system, when strongly affected on the body, is the loss of color in the hair, which has occasionally been observed after extreme terror or grief. One authentic instance has been recorded in the case of a man brought out for execution in India, in which the change of color was so rapid that it was perceptible to the eye. Another good case is that of the trembling of the muscles, which is common to man and to many or most of the lower animals. Trembling is of no service, often of much disservice, and cannot have been at first required through the will, and then rendered habitual in association with any emotion. I am assured by an eminent authority that young children do not tremble, but go into convulsions under the circumstances which would induce expressive trembling in adults. Trembling is excited in different individuals in very different degrees and by the most diversified causes, by cold to the surface, before fever fits, although the temperature of the body is then above the normal standard, in blood poisoning, delirium tremens, and other diseases, by general failure of power in old age, by exhaustion after excessive fatigue, locally from severe injuries such as burns, and, in an especial manner, by the passage of a catheter. Of all emotions, fear notoriously is the most apt to induce trembling, but so do occasionally great anger and joy, I remember once seeing a boy who had just shot his first snipe on the wing, and his hands trembled to such a degree from delight that he could not for some time reload his gun. And I have heard of an exactly similar case with an Australian savage to whom a gun had been lent, 
Fine music from the vague emotions thus excited causes a shiver to run down the backs of some persons. There seems to be very little in common in the above several physical causes and emotions to account for trembling. And Sir J. Paget, to whom I am indebted for several of the above statements, informs me that the subject is a very obscure one. As trembling is sometimes caused by rage, long before exhaustion can have set in, and as it sometimes accompanies great joy, it would appear that any strong excitement of the nervous system interrupts the steady flow of nerve force to the muscles. The manner in which the secretions of the alimentary canal and of certain glands, as the liver, kidneys, or mammae, are affected by strong emotions, is another excellent instance of the direct action of the sensorium on these organs, independently of the will or of any serviceable associated habit. There is the greatest difference in different persons in the parts which are thus affected, and in the degree of their affection. The heart, which goes on uninterruptedly, beating night and day in so wonderful a manner, is extremely sensitive to external stimulants. The great physiologist, Claude Bernard, has shown how the least excitement of a sensitive nerve reacts on the heart, even when a nerve is touched so slightly that no pain can possibly be felt by the animal under experiment. Hence, when the mind is strongly excited, we might expect that it would instantly affect, in a direct manner, the heart, and this is universally acknowledged and felt to be the case. Claude Bernard also repeatedly insists, and this deserves special notice, that when the heart is affected it reacts on the brain, and the state of the brain again reacts through the pneumogastric nerve on the heart, so that under any excitement there will be much mutual action and reaction between these, the two most important organs of the body. The vasomotor system, which regulates the diameter of the small arteries, is directly acted on by the sensorium, as we see when a man blushes from shame. But in this latter case, the checked transmission of nerve force to the vessels of the face can, I think, be partly explained in a curious manner through habit. We shall also be able to throw some light, though very little, on the involuntary erection of the hair under the emotions of terror and rage. The secretion of tears depends, no doubt, on the connection of certain nerve cells. But here again we can trace some few of the steps by which the flow of nerve force through the requisite channels has become habitual under certain emotions. A brief consideration of the outward signs of some of the stronger sensations and emotions will best serve to show us, although vaguely, in how complex a manner the principle under consideration of the direct action of the excited nervous system of the body is combined with the principle of habitually associated serviceable movements. When animals suffer from an agony of pain, they generally writhe about with frightful contortions, and those which habitually use their voices utter piercing cries or groans. Almost every muscle of the body is brought into strong action. With man the mouth may be closely compressed, or more commonly the lips are retracted, with the teeth clenched or ground together. There is said to be gnashing of teeth in hell. And I have plainly heard the grinding of the molar teeth of a cow which was suffering acutely from inflammation of the bowels. The female hippopotamus in the zoological gardens, when she produced her young, suffered greatly. She incessantly walked about or rolled on her sides, opening and closing her jaws, and clattering her teeth together. With man the eyes stare wildly as in horrified astonishment, or the brows are heavily contracted. Perspiration bathes the body, and drops trickle down the face. The circulation and respiration are much affected. Hence the nostrils are generally dilated and often quiver. Or the breath may be held until the blood stagnates in the purple face. If the agony be severe and prolonged, these signs all change. Utter prostration follows, with fainting or convulsions. A sensitive nerve, when irritated, transmits some influence to the nerve cell, whence it proceeds, and this transmits its influence first to the corresponding nerve cell on the opposite side of the body, and then upwards and downwards along the cerebrospinal column to other nerve cells, to a greater or lesser extent, according to the strength of the excitement, so that ultimately the whole nervous system may be affected.
This involuntary transmission of nerve force may or may not be accompanied by consciousness. Why the irritation of a nerve cell should generate or liberate nerve force is not known, but that this is the case seems to be the conclusion arrived at by all the greatest physiologists, such as Muller, Virchow, Bernard, etc. As Mr. Herbert Spencer remarks, it may be received as an, quote, unquestionable truth that at any moment the existing quantity of liberated nerve force, which in an inscrutable way produces in us the state we call feeling, must expend itself in some direction, must generate an equivalent manifestation of force somewhere, end quote. So that when the cerebrospinal system is highly excited and nerve force is liberated in excess, it may be expended in intense sensations, active thought, violent movements, or increased activity of the glands. Mr. Spencer further maintains that an quote, overflow of nerve force, undirected by any motive, will manifestly take the most habitual roots, and if these do not suffice, will next overflow into the less habitual ones, end quote. Consequently, the facial and respiratory muscles, which are the most used, will be apt to be first brought into action, then those of the upper extremities, next those of the lower, and finally those of the whole body. An emotion may be very strong, but it will have little tendency to induce movements of any kind, if it has not commonly led to voluntary action for its relief or gratification. And when movements are excited, their nature is, to a large extent, determined by those which have often and voluntarily been performed for some definite end under the same emotion. Great pain urges all animals, and has urged them during endless generations, to make the most violent and diversified efforts to escape from the cause of suffering. Even when a limb or other separate part of the body is hurt, we often see a tendency to shake it, as if to shake off the cause, though this may obviously be impossible. Thus, a habit of exerting with the utmost force all the muscles will have been established whenever great suffering is experienced. As the muscles of the chest and vocal organs are habitually used, these will be particularly liable to be acted on, and loud, harsh screams or cries will be uttered. But the advantage derived from outcries has here probably come into play in an important manner, for the young of most animals, when in distress or danger, call loudly to their parents for aid, as do the members of the same community for mutual aid. Another principle, namely the internal consciousness that the power or capacity of the nervous system is limited, will have strengthened, though in a subordinate degree, the tendency to violent action under extreme suffering. A man cannot think deeply and exert his utmost muscular force. As Hippocrates long ago observed, if two pains are felt at the same time, the severer one dulls the other. Martyrs, in the ecstasy of their religious fervor, have often, as it would appear, been insensible to the most horrid tortures. Sailors who are going to be flogged sometimes take a piece of lead in their mouths, in order to bite it with their utmost force, and thus to bear the pain. Parturient women prepare to exert their muscles to the utmost, in order to relieve their sufferings. We thus see that the undirected radiation of nerve force from the nerve cells which are first affected the long-continued habit of attempting by struggling to escape from the cause of suffering, and the consciousness that voluntary muscular exertion relieves pain, have all probably concurred in giving a tendency to the most violent, almost convulsive movements under extreme suffering. And such movements, including those of the vocal organs, are universally recognized as highly expressive of this condition. As the mere touching of a sensitive nerve reacts in a direct manner on the heart, severe pain will obviously react on it in like manner, but far more energetically. Nevertheless, even in this case, we must not overlook the indirect effects of habit on the heart, as we shall see when we consider the signs of rage. When a man suffers from an agony of pain, the perspiration often trickles down his face, and I have been assured by a veterinary surgeon that he has frequently seen drops falling from the belly and running down the inside of the thighs of horses and from the bodies of cattle when thus suffering. He has observed this when there has been no struggling which would account for the perspiration. 
the whole body of the female hippopotamus before alluded to, was covered with red-colored perspiration whilst giving birth to her young. So it is with extreme fear. The same veterinary has often seen horses sweating from this cause, as has Mr. Bartlett with the rhinoceros, and with man it is a well-known symptom. The cause of perspiration bursting forth in these cases is quite obscure, but it is thought by some physiologists to be connected with the failing power of the capillary circulation, and we know that the vasomotor system, which regulates the capillary circulation, is much influenced by the mind. With respect to the movements of certain muscles of the face under great suffering, as well as from other emotions, these will be best considered when we treat of the special expressions of man and of the lower animals. We will now turn to the characteristic symptoms of rage. Under this powerful emotion, the action of the heart is much accelerated, or it may be much disturbed. The face reddens, or it becomes purple from the impeded return of the blood, or may turn deadly pale. The respiration is labored, the chest heaves, and the dilated nostrils quiver. The whole body often trembles. The voice is affected. The teeth are clenched or ground together, and the muscular system is commonly stimulated to violent, almost frantic action. But the gestures of a man in this state usually differ from the purposeless writhings and struggles of one suffering from an agony of pain, for they represent more or less plainly the act of striking or fighting with an enemy. All these signs of rage are probably in large part, and some of them appear to be wholly due to the direct action of the excited sensorium. But animals of all kinds, and their progenitors before them, when attacked or threatened by an enemy, have exerted their utmost powers in fighting and in defending themselves. Unless an animal does thus act, or has the intention, or at least the desire to attack its enemy, it cannot properly be said to be enraged. An inherited habit of muscular exertion will thus have been gained, in association with rage, and this will directly or indirectly affect various organs, in nearly the same manner as does great bodily suffering. The heart, no doubt, will likewise be affected in a direct manner, but it will also, in all probability, be affected through habit, and all the more so from not being under the control of the will. We know that any great exertion which we voluntarily make affects the heart, through mechanical and other principles which need not be here considered. And it was shown in the first chapter that nerve force flows readily through habitually used channels, through the nerves of voluntary or involuntary movement, and through those of sensation. Thus even a moderate amount of exertion will tend to act on the heart, and on the principle of association, of which so many instances have been given, we may feel entirely sure that any given sensation or emotion, as great pain or rage, which has habitually led to much muscular action, will immediately influence the flow of nerve force to the heart, although there may not be at the time any muscular exertion. The heart, as I have said, will be all the more readily affected through habitual associations, as it is not under the control of the will. A man, when moderately angry or even when enraged, may command the movements of his body, but he cannot prevent his heart from beating rapidly. His chest will perhaps give a few heaves, and his nostrils just quiver, for the movements of respiration are only in part voluntary. In like manner, those muscles of the face which are least obedient to the will will sometimes alone betray a slight and passing emotion. The glands again are wholly independent of the will, and a man suffering from grief may command his features, but cannot always prevent the tears from coming into his eyes. A hungry man, if tempting food is placed before him, may not show his hunger by any outward gesture, but he cannot check the secretion of saliva. Under a transport of joy or vivid pleasure, there is a strong tendency to various purposeless movements and to the utterance of various sounds. We see this in our young children, in their loud laughter, clapping of hands, and jumping for joy in the bounding and barking of a dog when going out to walk with its master, and in the frisking of a horse when turned out into an open field. Joy quickens the circulation, and this stimulates the brain, 
which again reacts on the whole body. The above purposeless movements and increased heart action may be attributed in chief part to the excited state of the sensorium, and to the consequent undirected flow, as Mr. Herbert Spencer insists, of nerve force. It deserves notice that it is chiefly the anticipation of pleasure, and not its actual enjoyment, which leads to purposeless and extravagant movements of the body, and to the utterance of various sounds. We see this in our children when they expect any great pleasure or treat, and dogs which have been bounding about at the sight of a plate of food, when they get it, do not show their delight by any outward action, not even by wagging of tails. Now with animals of all kinds, the acquirement of almost all their pleasures, with the exception of those of warmth and rest, are associated, and have long been associated, with active movements, as in the hunting or search for food, and in their courtship. Moreover, the mere exertion of the muscles after long rest or confinement is in itself a pleasure, as we ourselves feel, and as we see in the play of young animals. Therefore, on this latter principle alone we might perhaps expect that vivid pleasure would be apt to show itself conversely in muscular movements. With all or almost all animals, even with birds, terror causes the body to tremble. The skin becomes pale, sweat breaks out, and the hair bristles. The secretions of the alimentary canal and of the kidneys are increased, and they are involuntarily voided, owing to the relaxation of the sphincter muscles, as is known to be the case with man, and as I have seen with cattle, dogs, cats, and monkeys. The breathing is hurried, the heart beats quickly, wildly, and violently, but whether it pumps the blood more efficiently through the body may be doubted, or the surface seems bloodless and the strength of the muscles soon fails. In a frightened horse I have felt through the saddle the beating of the heart so plainly that I could have counted the beats. The mental faculties are much disturbed. Utter prostration soon follows, and even fainting. A terrified canary bird has been seen not only to tremble and to turn white about the base of the bill, but to faint. And I once caught a robin in a room which fainted so completely that for a time I thought it dead. Most of these symptoms are probably the direct result, independently of habit, of the disturbed state of the sensorium, but it is doubtful whether they ought to be wholly thus accounted for. When an animal is alarmed, it almost always stands motionless for a moment, in order to collect its senses and to ascertain the source of danger, and sometimes for the sake of escaping detection. But headlong flight soon follows, with no husbanding of the strength as in fighting, and the animal continues to fly as long as the danger lasts, until utter prostration, with failing respiration and circulation, with all the muscles quivering and profuse sweating, renders further flight impossible. Hence it does not seem improbable that the principle of associated habit may in part account for, or at least augment, some of the above-named characteristic symptoms of extreme terror. That the principle of associated habit has played an important part in causing the movements expressive of the foregoing several strong emotions and sensations, we may, I think, conclude from considering, firstly, some other strong emotions which do not ordinarily require for their relief or gratification any voluntary movement, and secondly, the contrast in nature between the so-called exciting and depressing states of the mind. No emotion is stronger than maternal love, but a mother may feel the deepest love for her helpless infant, and yet not show it by any outward sign, or only by slight caressing movements with a gentle smile and tender eyes. But let any one intentionally injure her infant, and see what a change, how she starts up with threatening aspect, how her eyes sparkle and her face reddens, how her bosom heaves, nostrils dilate, and heart beats, for anger, and not maternal love, has habitually led to action. The love between the opposite sexes is widely different from maternal love, and when lovers meet, we know that their hearts beat quickly, their breathing is hurried, and their faces flush, for this love is not inactive like that of a mother for her infant. 
A man may have his mind filled with the blackest hatred or suspicion, or be corroded with envy or jealousy, but as these feelings do not at once lead to action, and as they commonly last for some time, they are not shown by any outward sign, excepting that a man in this state assuredly does not appear cheerful or good-tempered. If indeed these feelings break out into overt acts, rage takes their place and will be plainly exhibited. Painters can hardly portray suspicion, jealousy, envy, etc., except by the aid of accessories which tell the tale. And poets use such vague and fanciful expressions as, quote, green-eyed jealousy, end quote. Spencer describes suspicion as, quote, foul, ill-favored, and grim, under his eyebrows still askance, end quote, etc., Shakespeare speaks of envy, quote, as lean-faced in her loathsome case, end quote. And in another place he says, quote, no black envy shall make my grave, end quote. And again, as, quote, above pale envy's threatening reach, end quote. Emotions and sensations have often been classed as exciting or depressing. When all the organs of the body and mind, those of voluntary and involuntary movement, of perception, sensation, thought, etc., perform their functions more energetically and rapidly than usual, a man or animal may be said to be excited, and under an opposite state, to be depressed. Anger and joy are from the first exciting emotions, and they naturally lead, more especially the former, to energetic movements, which react on the heart and this again on the brain. A physician once remarked to me as proof of the exciting nature of anger that a man, when excessively jaded, will sometimes invent imaginary offenses and put himself into a passion, unconsciously for the sake of reinvigorating himself. And since hearing this remark, I have occasionally recognized its full truth. Several other states of mind appear to be at first exciting, but soon become depressing to an extreme degree. When a mother suddenly loses her child, sometimes she is frantic with grief and must be considered to be in an excited state. She walks wildly about, tears her hair or clothes, and wrings her hands. This latter action is perhaps due to the principle of antithesis, betraying an inward sense of helplessness and that nothing can be done. The other wild and violent movements may be in part explained by the relief experienced through muscular exertion, and in part by the undirected overflow of nerve force from the excited sensorium. But under the sudden loss of a beloved person, one of the first and commonest thoughts which occurs is that something more might have been done to save the lost one. An excellent observer, in describing the behavior of a girl at the sudden death of her father, says she, quote, went about the house wringing her hands like a creature demented, saying, it was her fault. I should never have left him if I had only sat up with him, end quote. With such ideas vividly present before the mind, they would arise through the principle of associated habit, the strongest tendency to energetic action of some kind. As soon as the sufferer is fully conscious that nothing can be done, despair or deep sorrow takes the place of frantic grief. The sufferer sits motionless, or gently rocks to and fro. The circulation becomes languid, respiration is almost forgotten, and deep sighs are drawn. Pain, if severe, soon induces extreme depression or prostration but it is at first a stimulant and excites to action as we see when we whip a horse. And as is shown by the horrid tortures inflicted in foreign lands on exhausted dray bullocks, to rouse them to renewed exertion. Fear again is the most depressing of all the emotions, and it soon induces utter helpless prostration, as if in consequence of, or in association with, the most violent and prolonged attempts to escape from the danger, though no such attempts have actually been made. Nevertheless, even extreme fear often acts at first as a powerful stimulant. A man or animal driven through terror to desperation is endowed with wonderful strength and is notoriously dangerous in the highest degree. 
On the whole, we may conclude that the principle of the direct action of the sensorium on the body, due to the constitution of the nervous system and from the first independent of the will, has been highly influential in determining many expressions. Good instances are afforded by the trembling of the muscles, the sweating of the skin, the modified secretions of the alimentary canal, and glands, under various emotions and sensations. But actions of this kind are often combined with others which follow from our first principle, namely, that actions which have often been of direct or indirect service, under certain states, of the mind, in order to gratify or relieve certain sensations, desires, etc., are still performed under analogous circumstances, through mere habit, although of no service. We have combinations of this kind, at least in part, in the frantic gestures of rage and in the writhings of extreme pain, and perhaps in the increased action of the heart and of the respiratory organs. Even when these and other emotions or sensations are aroused in a very feeble manner, there will still be a tendency to similar actions, owing to the force of long-associated habit, and those actions which are least under voluntary control will generally be longest retained. Our second principle of antithesis has likewise occasionally come into play. Finally, so many expressive movements can be explained, as I trust will be seen in the course of this volume, through the three principles which have now been discussed, that we may hope hereafter to see all thus explained, or by closely analogous principles. It is, however, often impossible to decide how much weight ought to be attributed, in each particular case, to one of our principles and how much to another and very many points in the theory of expression remain inexplicable. End of section 6